we're launching our first ever seminar event, the Fine Home Building Summit. Join us October 2nd through the 4th in Southbridge, Massachusetts, as 12 of the building industry's most notable experts will offer more than 50 hours of presentations. Our goal? To explore advanced design principles, discover cutting edge construction materials, and share trusted techniques. Space for this event is limited and expected to sell out fast. Don't wait. Visit finehomebuilding.com slash summit to pre-register. That's finehomebuilding.com slash summit. But I mean, a, a plate compactor, the one that I looked up was like 163 pounds. Two you guys can drive can carry that, that right outside. through the living room. <laughs> you can, you, yeah. Well, you can, two people can carry that right through the living room. No problem. <laughs> As easy as they can carry. I gotta put that across the hardwoods. Yeah. <laughs> Wear your booties. Welcome to the Fine Home Building Podcast, our weekly discussion of building, remodeling, and design topics aimed at anybody who cares deeply about the craft and science of working on houses. This is Senior Editor Patrick McComb. I'm joined by Kindly Jacques, Design Editor, Deputy Editor Matt Milham. What up? And Producer Jeff Rose. Hello. Please email us your questions to fhbpodcast at taunton.com. You can find previous podcasts and check out the show notes at finehomebuilding.com slash podcast. So, guys, we had some listener feedback on mm-hmm. a couple of recent discussions. Our uh, Moss on Roofs uh, <laughs> chat got some a few people to chime in that they had similar experiences to yours where they had to remove Moss. It's always and- surprising to me what people get excited to talk about <laughs> it's just because they had to pay money for it right. and that is like really what money gets, gets people excited that gets people's to, attention yeah. for yeah. sure that's right that's true uh, Bob from Home Remodeling Pros, which is in Annapolis, Maris, Maryland, wrote, he said, had moss on a roof once. An insurance company told me the concern was that the moss roots may penetrate shingles and create a leak. <laughs> he says, I have no idea what the likelihood of this happening is. Yeah. I can guarantee <laughs> the insurance company probably really doesn't know anything about houses. The actuaries I, or whoever is coming up with these, like, Hairbrained explanations yeah. probably don't really know what they're talking about. Is my guess. So if there are any As biologists out there I don't. who <laughs> actually know about is moss damaging to building materials, roofing specifically, we would love to hear from you because I, I wouldn't doubt that it does something. But roots, my <laughs> <laughs> give me a break. Moss don't. Yeah, they don't. My experience is like don't have a lot it, of is like it does per pull se. off the granules, yeah. but I thought that was related to physically Move, removing yeah, yeah, the moss, right. which is mechanically right. attached to the right. I, I and mean, like, if you left it there, would it really be damaging? I don't know. I don't know either. I'm sure it's doing something. It, it, I mean, some of those things like lichen and whatever they can kind of eat away at materials. You know, whatever sure. it is in the biologic process creates some sort of acid. I don't know if moss does the same kind of thing or not and does it move on a rolling roof does it grow on a rolling roof i'm gonna go home (laughs) (laughs) yeah build a (laughs) roundhouse like the kind of like that mars movie where it just kind of rotates and you just kind of like walk around the outside of it i'm gonna go home and rip a shingle off and see what's going on on the back side of it yeah oh that's a good idea (laughs) no roots take a few you want a sample (laughs) So maybe there's a uh, roofing manufacturer out there who listens to this. Uh, if you have any knowledge of what Moss does to roof shingles, uh, once again, we'd love to hear from you. Uh, Doug wrote in, uh, just finished watching the latest podcast when you guys got to the discussion of old schoolhouses and speculated. So you were mentioning that you lived in a schoolhouse uh, yeah. at, at a period, and you talked about how cold it was. Yeah. Um, and so the question was, uh, I asked, did, did some, was it some student's job to come and light the fire in the wood stove? And this gentleman says, um, my mom taught country school, a country school, I love it, for yeah. a couple of years in the 30s. One year she had her youngest brother as an eighth grade student. Their <laughs> father made her brother go to early to build the fire and help clean. <laughs> It's something he complained about to his dying day. <laughs> I can believe it. Yeah, yeah and the, the schoolhouse that I lived in, it probably only served like one, two, maybe three families. And I mean, because there are schoolhouses all over that county, little tiny schoolhouses. And I mean, the kids had to be able to walk there. And the farms are big. I mean, like hundreds of acres at least. Most of them were probably at dairies at the time. How do you think of like three families could afford to pay a teacher in that time period? I mean, that's, that's kind of crazy. Big families. I don't know. <laughs> 
<laughs> that doesn't boost your earning power. And in, in fact, I'd say it it harms it. Yeah, and I don't know if the you I don't know, know exactly. farm family style. Was like, You're like yeah. work. Yeah. You have workers, right? Yeah. So I don't know exactly how it was all being paid for, subsidized, because this particular house that I lived in um, was probably built in like the 1920s or so. Maybe even later than that. It had a, a map from I think nineteen the nineteen twenties. Yeah, it hmm. had a it, like it had an old map uh, from like pre Nazi era, like nineteen thirties. Mm-hmm. Um, but I think that may have been original. But yeah, I mean, it, it was still on a dirt road. I mean, that road mm-hmm. that I lived on still is not paved. <laughs> it's still a, a very those, rural area. Are a lot of those old school houses now houses? Um, they are in Vermont. They are, yeah, they're either small houses or a bunch of them are abandoned. Some of right. them turned into little museums and things like that. Yep. Yeah. Towns often end up with them yeah. as museums and mm-hmm. oftentimes they're moved to mm-hmm. town greens and stuff. Yeah. There's another little schoolhouse that's been turned into a museum right near me. They have st- all these kinds of things. They have like a pumpkin chucking competition, I think. I'm going to try to get to. <laughs> I've always wanted to go to one of those. Do you know what yeah. this is? I can picture what it is. I've not been to one. Right though. now, there's a gigantic trebuchet parked outside of and this one And then they use the trebuchet <laughs> or cannons to fire pumpkins. Oh, okay. it looks I didn't like, picture that. It looks like great fun. Yeah. Patrick, <laughs> that does not surprise me that that's of interest to you. <laughs> <laughs> and, and mostly men are involved. Mm-hmm. Yes. Single that much, I would guess. Most but... single men. No. <laughs> single or soon to be single. <laughs> <laughs> Rob was telling me that he went to um, a bachelor engineer's uh, estate sale. Um, this man had just died recently, and the, he was describing the collection of tools and train collectibles and stuff that this guy had, including a, a library that covered his four walls in his office, floor to ceiling, with books on every like engineering topic known to man. From like mm-hmm. building bridges to like wire rope and heating and air conditioning design, and it was just like, what did Rob buy? Uh, he bought some <laughs> tools. <laughs> I wanted to buy the bridge port, but it was actually we theorized that the guy had taken part of his basement wall down to bring it into the basement. Hmm. You know what a bridge port is? It's a milling machine. It's used in machine machinists use it to make metal stuff. Um, <laughs> That That's a really inadequate yeah. uh, description, yeah. isn't it? <laughs> a little bit, but I have no idea. Do you idea want to what try it, better? I have no idea what it is. <laughs> so it's a three axis mill. It's like a lathe, but the, okay. the head also moves. Okay. Uh, well, it's not like a lathe because the work stays stationary, but the cutting tool can move in three axes around this piece of metal. Or okay. Move. It's the precursor of the CNC. Mm. Yeah. Have you used it's, one? No. So why do you want it? Because they're awesome. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think it's hard to use. I think it's hard to know how to use it. And like, hard to move. <laughs> moving is definitely yeah. hard. Yeah. This thing looked like it weighs thousands of pounds. Mm. The good ones do. I would take your word for it. Yeah. I, I had to pass on that, unfortunately. You've been busy. Yeah. What do you, like, masonry. <laughs> <laughs> turns out I'm not the master mason that I believed myself to be. Well, it's, it's hard. <laughs> Somehow I thought I would just innately be really good at it, and I am not. <laughs> but what? I can ex- excavate field stone like nobody's business. Where did you, so you, you sent us a picture of your this stone. Where did it come from? So at the very tail end of the wall, it was an existing wall that I was repairing. And at the tail end of it, it took this weird curve back toward the house which I fixed. This is, this is not the curve I'm referring to. I created that curve. So uh, anyway, so it was probably about an eight-foot curve mm-hmm. that went down about almost four feet, and it was all of that stone and lots of cement around it. Mm. So I had to chip away all of the cement <laughs> and dig it out and roll it into the drive. And I mean, it was, I felt you are so tough. strong. Yeah. Look at that beautiful stone. I know. Stone is awesome. I, if I hadn't discovered all of that, I wouldn't have been able to finish my wall without buying some stone. So I was thrilled. I bet that's close to half of a pallet or a pallet. Yeah. And it made the um, – I found some really nice pieces to, to do the very tail end of it where I made my own little – So when you travel, cool. do you, like, seek out uh, nice rocks to put in your rock wall? Like, for a long time I was bringing home rocks from different parts of Vermont because we were <laughs> – Landscaping. That's a good idea. No, I haven't needed to do that. Well, I don't know if it's a good idea, but it's... Why not? (laughs) (laughs) Just grab one rock at a time. Yeah. It's like I eat an elephant one bite at a time. (laughs) Same way you build a rock wall. (laughs) 
Only you, Matt. <laughs> you must have got started drinking early today. So. <laughs> it is, we are starting late, as usual. <laughs> yeah. So uh, are you happy with how it turned out? Yeah, it's not quite finished. You'll see there. See that very end stone, the cap that I found there? Yes. It's got these two beautiful, it's, it's, not, it's lichen, I guess. Your insurance company is going to make you take care so, of that. Yeah. <laughs> I really liked how it, how it terminated. So but you can see I still have a little bit more mortaring to do. And it turns out I'm, I'm really mostly just moored the top of it. So I have to get back in there and fill in some big holes. Cool. My uh, couple attempts at uh, masonry uh, did not go so well. I remember you mentioning that you yeah. wound up using your hands a lot for yeah. the mortar. I definitely did that yeah. too. <laughs> it's not the right way. <laughs> and I um, you know, didn't listen to your tip when I first got started. And for whatever reason, I started right at my door. Uh -huh. Oh, right, the obvious, obvious place. place. <laughs> and I was smearing it all over. And sure enough, it's it's sort of white, you know, yeah. will always be. You can get color. some, uh, dilute some hydrochloric acid and put it on it, brush it, and then uh, just kind of rinse it w real good mm -hmm. with water. Okay. And it should take care of that. Okay. Where does one buy this uh, high strength chlor well, uh, hydrochloric acid? If you're me. It's going to melt my body and parts. you're engaged to a, a chemistry teacher, you would just wait until she has to clean out her, her chemical closet and then she just brings two bottles of it home. <laughs> but uh, yeah, if you go to the store, it's uh, muriatic acid or uh, is what it's It's hard to buy called. the good stuff, right? I mean, it's all diluted? Uh, well, usually it comes and you need to dilute it. Okay. Even, even the stuff that you buy in the store. So, But yeah, if you go to your masonry supply, you should be able to pick up a bottle, just a gallon. Well, it's not that And you'll much. dilute it like 1 to 20 or something like that. But be careful with it because it looks like water. Well, yeah. also, it would. I don't want to get it on the mortar that I want to keep, right? I mean, you have uh, to be pretty no, delicate it'll, with it. it'll be fine. It just goes after yeah, thin, you thin just layers. You only leave it on for like less than a minute. I mean, you, okay. you kind of brush it on, I brush see. the areas that just, are kind yeah. of like stained that you want to get the stain off of, cool. and then immediately rinse it off. Okay. Yeah. All right. What's next on the agenda besides finishing the wall? Finding a land surveyor. Right. Can't find one. Nobody will call me back. What Why is that so difficult? I don't know. <laughs> it's just your it's like, approach. Nobody likes that neighborhood, maybe. Apparently. <laughs> it is a complicated situation. I've stopped telling people that, though. All I wouldn't I tell them anything. All I say is I need a yeah. residential survey done. Can you do it? Yeah. Zero What's your response. address? <laughs> Floodbridge Road. <laughs> they start looking Click. into it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, I was telling Matt that I, I would like to try doing a little bit dr of drywall repair. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I've got some places that, that need it. That is definitely something one needs and to have. And he just did a master in a minute. So I, I watched that and I thought, I can do that. I know I can. So yeah. I will. And then I'll come back with the results. And like the worst case scenario with a lot of that stuff is just you just sand it all off and start yeah. over again. You keep, right. Just keep working at it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I might try a little piece in the closet just to see how it goes. Yeah. I was drywalling last night and uh, it is something you get better at, but I don't do it often enough to get really good at it. Uh, I'm terrible at it, and I I'm not a fan of it, right. like of the work. I mean, like I love going to watch Myron do it because he makes it look so, so easy, and then easy. I get excited. Yes, and I think I'm going to go home and do the same thing. <laughs> I just have and to I do what Myron it. did. <laughs> yeah, and then it ends up looking like dog meat every time. <laughs> like, what kind of repairs are you doing? Like ripping like out a ceiling okay. and That's replacing not what it. This yeah, is. or okay. like a big hole in a ceiling. Okay. Yeah, like when I ripped down the wall between two bedrooms and had to like patch that all in. It was kind of a weird shape because mm -hmm. there was a, a closet in each room, mm -hmm. and then part of it was just wall. And so I ended up with this, yeah, sort of like it shaped like the number nine almost in the ceiling. That <laughs> That's does sound to, tricky. That's hard yeah. to hide. And I, yeah, so it was a little. I got to tell you, there are like three things that I would say that really improved my drywall finishing. And number one is you have to bend your finishing knives not your taping knife but the wider knives just slightly and you that and you put the the hump up over nail holes and you kind of use it the other way on inside corners and uh it really really improves the quality of finish yeah and myron taught me that and I've tried to do that. I remember seeing him, I, like, it, long before I came here, uh, like, at JLC, seeing him do that. And I was like, yeah, that seems like a good idea. I, I don't know. Still hasn't you worked for me. You have to do it for yeah. it to work. Yeah. <laughs> no, and I've tried, I've tried bending the knives, and, like, I've got a slight curve in there. Uh -huh. But it's still, I'm just like, am I pushing too hard? Because a lot of it's just like the feel. You can't replicate that. No. Like, what's right. he going to do? He's going to put in my hand, and he's going to, right. you know. And the other thing I've learned is, like, so... When the, with the angle cl uh, closer to the surface, the wall surface or ceiling surface, you're you're laying down the compound. You're mm -hmm. you're, you're filling in the whatever you're filling, right? Yeah. And, but if you hold it at a, at a more 
uh, yeah, a steep, steep angle, angle, you're scraping it off. Yep. So, so using those two motions together, you can put the right amount of compound on so you're not getting blobs in your hair and in your eye. Uh, which is what I used to do, but you guys are making yeah. me not want to do this. Well, it's messy. It's messy work, and you just yeah. have to. It's really uh, this situation is more like you have holes. Sur- it's not holes really even. It's surface um, ripping of the you know outer paper kind mm-hmm. of. So it's just it just looks ugly. Yeah, not... you got to mix your mud too. Yeah, that's the other thing is like people don't do. They start using it straight from the bucket and or the box, and it, it's not the right consistency. And you sometimes have to thin it, but oftentimes you don't. You just have to mix it and get some uh, air introduced into it. Yeah. Which makes it fluffier, like whipped cream. Mm-hmm. Hey, what about you guys? What have you been doing? Yeah, what have you been Nobody doing? Nobody wants to hear what I'm doing. It's the same thing. <laughs> shed. <laughs> Working on the shed nonstop. <laughs> no, now I'm like... I, it looks like the, you're gardening, too. All the siding's done, and now I'm caulking, and I hate... That, that <laughs> is right up there with drywall and things I don't want to do. <laughs> So, like, I'm doing, like, one corner at a time, and then, like, I pretty much reached my limit. And because a lot of this is because, and I think I've talked about this before, I was really cheap in building the shed. And so the trim is not deep enough to completely cover the ends yes. of the Yeah, so you use siding. three-quarter stock for your exactly. lap yeah. siding. Yep. And so, and I think I mentioned before that this siding, I think I said it was 7 16 so I think it's actually 3 8 inch thick, the stuff that I got. Yeah. I think they do make a thicker one, but this one is 3 8 doesn't matter because with the three quarter with the little you know angle, you can solve that or you could have you just pack out your three quarter stock a little bit oh yeah yeah and i thought about doing that and then i was like do i really yeah, want to do that it. i don't really want to do that <laughs> so yeah um yeah so i didn't so think something's matter and, something's and so still- like then you got to go you're basically like wrapping around yeah. the plane like for every bead and uh it's very tedious i'm sure and thinking about it if i had to go back and do it all over again i would just pack that out <laughs> I would. Right. Because of the labor it's co- yeah. costing and and caulking it. Can you yeah. explain what you mean by packing it out? So you put shims behind the three-quarter uh, stock shims. to, to make okay. it thicker yeah. in essence. Understand and now. because there's either another piece of trim on it or it's abutting something or they're siding against it, you don't see the gap. Okay. Mm-hmm. So how much caulk are you going to go through? Not that much. Mm-hmm. I mean, probably Case. I bought six tubes. I'll probably go through six. That's, just that's for, kind of a lot. That's just Seems for like that. Yeah. Like, how big's the shed? No, I've, uh, I've only gone through two so far. I'm like, I'm more than halfway done and I've gone through two tubes, so not that How much, much beer have you gone through? Oh, man. <laughs> <laughs> Cases? <laughs> what about your bed, Patrick? So I've, uh, I've been working on a new uh, project. I, it's called Patrick's No Fuss Furniture Line, <laughs> and this is going to have some um, serious potential. Yeah. Yeah. It says Ikea so this to is me. My, this is my platform bed. It is made of uh, C-select pine and three-quarter inch, uh, you know, veneer pine plywood. And uh, I think I have $175 in this thing so far. Fabulous. Cool. Yeah. I got the drawer slides for, uh, it's a platform bed. There's three drawers on both sides, and I got the slides for that uh, delivered to my house yesterday from Amazon. Can you believe 10 sets of high quality Amazon branded? Amazon branded. And I was going to ask who actually Amazon made these Amazon Basics. Okay. okay. I don't know who makes them. Yeah. But they're really, they're really nice. They were, the box of 10 of them was super heavy, and uh, it was $66. Wow. Wow. Sixty-six bucks. What kind? What, what were you expecting to spend? That oh, much if you per bought, slides. I mean, if you bought yeah. like really good German ones, like they'd cost that much for a single drawer box oh. yeah. or more. For like Some of them are like seventy-five dollars. Yeah. So what? What style are they? They're side mount, full extension, soft close. Okay. They That'll have be nice. all the, the soft close will be nice. All the bells and whistles. And yeah. ball bearings. Makes it really hard when you get angry to slam anything, though. I know. The whole effect <laughs> is really yeah. lost. You kick it, and it's just... <laughs> I'm out of underwear. <laughs> <laughs> One of the things that really gets my go to slamming yeah. of doors and drawers anyway. Yeah. So, like, I don't, yeah. I don't do it. My dad lost his mind on me one day when I was a teenager for slamming doors. So, oh, yeah. I don't do it. <laughs> <laughs> Got conditioned out of you. Uh, so we talk about some listener questions. Let's do it. So Aaron from Pittsburgh writes, uh, greetings podcast team, huge fan of the show. Keep up the good work. Thanks, Aaron. 
I recently got together with some friends from Washington, D.C., and the real estate market there is crazy. I've heard the same. Many houses are on the market for less than a week, and if you want to buy, you often have to come mortgage pre-approved, offer over the asking price, and forgo having your own inspection. Most houses have pre-purchased inspections done, so you get to see the report, but not necessarily hire your own inspector. My question, with such short evaluation windows, what advice would you give people that are buying their first house in this market? To ask another way, are there red flags or obvious things to look for that can hint hint at the build quality of a house? Best regards from the Steel City. So, it's a great question. It is a great question. So, what did you look for when you you're the most recent home yeah. purchaser on the podcast team here? What did you look for? Well, it wasn't. I didn't know what to look for. Quite frankly, that's why I think this is a good question. Yeah. And so, I'd like to go through what, what you pointed out here. Well, no, that, that, let's let's hold off on that because okay. he wrote, he wrote this. Oh, he wrote this. Yes, so, I didn't catch that. So let's talk okay. about what we would say, and then we're okay. going to give his list. All right. He was he was he was helping us out. Yeah, this is a great. Like, this is, I thought this came from. I thought this was an article that was something that you shared. Well, it's like a fine home building article, it's gonna which be. it should be. Yeah, yeah. it's going to be. Okay, that make all right. That's even that's even cooler. Well, my first thing was going to is the, basically his first thing on this list, mm-hmm. and I I still you know I bought my house. Should about, we just read his list? Yeah, we can. I think okay. so. Yeah. I was just going to say the first thing I do is want to see the basement, which drives the yeah. real estate agents totally crazy they're oh. like you you really want to see that and i'm like yeah because that's yeah. where the expensive stuff yeah, is i see yeah everything that, else is easy to fix and also mm. i mean if you can see evidence of water damage down there if it exists yeah, yeah. and sometimes it's a non-starter mm-hmm. I, you know like no i'm not going to buy this house because it's full of water in the basement right? right i don't care how much i love the bathroom if this yeah. thing right. is packed with mold uh, yeah so i, I think yeah. i was most concerned with the roof and that's just because that's what I was told to be looking at when I went because yeah. I went by myself and I, you know, I didn't, I didn't know what to look for, but Did I just one of us look- tell you that <laughs> <laughs> I didn't know you guys yet. So, <laughs> so Aaron, um, gave us his 10, 10 tips. He, he claims to be a savvy real estate guy. And mm-hmm. based on what he's written here, I would totally agree. So he says, check to see when the house sold last. This can point to a flip, which isn't always bad, but flips tend to use lower quality materials that might not stand up over time. And if you've ever seen any of those shows, you can tell what's going on behind the wall is not always up to snuff on the flipping scenario. Yeah. Um, And how does one find out when a house was last sold? I guess you go to the town office, right? You you do that. A lot of times I get real estate listings every day from Zillow. Yes. uh, Because I've just never turned the alert off after I bought my house. And I check them out almost every day. And the same houses will come up. Hmm. About every five, six months, it seems like. Yeah, you know, and I'll see they're a house off and the market, and then they're back on. They're like, yeah. oh, this is just on the market. But you're like, I've seen this house a year and, ago. Yeah, and it's like double what it was the last time. And I'm like, oh, let's see what they did. <laughs> and it's always like, yeah. I'm like, I do not understand why they decide to do some of the things they do. Like, they won't rearrange the footprint, but they'll redo the kitchen, and they have, like, this awful tile in there. And right. I'm like, why did you waste all the money on mm. that? Mm-hmm. Like, you're probably not going to recoup that because nobody's going to pay for that garbage. <laughs> no, and, and flippers, like, th- their only way to make money is on the sale price, right? So they ha- their, their mo- singular motivation is to keep the repairs to the absolute yeah. minimum, right? right? It's make like, it look good. It's yeah. got to be as cheap as possible Try for them to, get to make it out money. Try to your hands mm-hmm. before yeah. you have to make your first payment. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Aaron says you can get a decent idea if a wall is load-bearing or not by going into the basement or attic. If you have grand plans for an open floor plan remodel, this info could be critical. That's Agreed. Such a good point. Yeah. yeah. In the same vein, while you're in the basement, look for the main drain stack. Moving the drain stack is rarely easy and often impossible. Also true. Uh, look at the mechanicals. How old is the hot water tank, furnace, etc.? Are they direct vent or do they run through a chimney? Is it forced air or hot water heat? If it's forced air, does it have AC? If it's hot water... What will it take to add AC later? All good questions, especially if you're going to live in Washington, D.C. Right. Yeah. Um, do you, how old is the roof? See if this is disclosed in any of the paperwork. That was what you said, Kylie. Yeah. I was able to determine how old it was. Moss growing on it old. <laughs> <laughs> do you see signs of previous damage or repair, interior or exterior? Can you look in the attic? Any ob- obvious water damage? What about added insulation? Uh, are the windows and doors original, and what's the quality? Older vinyl windows or hollow core doors might point to overall lower house quality. Also agreed. Um, do the windows function? Are they painted shut, missing hardware, or do they slam closed and you try to leave them open? I did test for that. 
I think every one of the windows in the house I grew up either was painted shut or was held open with a broom, still length of broom handle. <laughs> mm-hmm. <laughs> that was just normal. Like, yeah. People wonder why I tolerate some stuff, and I think that's like, well, because I didn't have windows that worked growing up. It's right. like, eh, it's fine, a stick. Uh, I'm, this might be frowned upon, but I'm not shy about pulling up a corner of carpet to see if there are hardwoods underneath. He says, try a closet first. Is he going there like a utility <laughs> knife and just starts cutting away? I like, hope what are so. you doing? <laughs> That's hilarious. <laughs> um, he calls them bulkheads. I've called them soffits. These are the, yeah. the things over uh, kitchen cabinets that go take up the space between the tops of the cabinets and the ceiling. And he says, bulkheads in kitchens may have ductwork or other utility lines in them. Uh, don't always assume you can remove them to install taller upper cabinets. Uh, and his uh, last piece of advice is bring a flashlight, which whenever I've had friends have me look at their uh, prospective uh, real estate purchases, I, I always have a flashlight and I always take a scratch haul because I want to poke around the mud sill and the ends of the joists to see if they're rotted. Yeah. You can't do that in much of the house, but there that's all exposed. Yeah. I mean, it, just in general, I would say, I mean, I do not like the home buying process in the U.S., and I'm, what I'm guessing is most of the U.S. I mean, you know, for my own house, I know it, it was just frustrating the amount of time that you get to spend in the house looking at it mm-hmm. with the realtor. Like, you can't really get into everything that you want to get into. And maybe other places are different. I don't because know. Because the real estate agent wants you to hurry along? or I well, mean, like, no, I've never, I've never that. felt that they were rushing it's me. It's not even that. Like, if I'm buying a car, I get to test drive it. If I'm sure. buying a house, I don't get to spend a week in it. I don't get to look <laughs> at the point. utility <laughs> bills and see how much it's going to cost me. Yeah. I get all that with a car. Sure. But there's no regulation saying that anybody has to provide any of that information when you're buying a house. So it Isn't is like, Massachusetts it's the, considering that? I don't know. I but, think so. But it's like the biggest purchase you're ever going to make in your life, and you know less about it than you do about literally like a pencil that you would buy on Amazon. <laughs> and that to me just like is so irritating. And even like in New York, I think in order to get your own inspector in there, you have to be under contract. Yes. Mm-hmm. And then in order like for in most cases, I think most sellers probably do this. They don't have to disclose any of the known defects to you. All they have to do is give you a $500 basically deduction on the amount that you're paying for the house. And then all that basically all of their knowledge of everything that's wrong with the house just is like goes into a, a black hole somewhere and you get to figure it out yourself, but you got 500 bucks. That's New York <laughs> to, specific. Uh, yeah. And I, I don't know if other States are similar or, hmm. you know, if they have I'm similar rules, but it's, it's, to me, it's a joke. Mm-hmm. You, I don't think you have to disclose anything, um, unless someone asks, right? right? But even if they ask, I don't think they're under any they're under no obligation. At we, least we need to get a real estate attorney on the on the show and say, like just ask them yeah. questions because yeah. like uh, can you get a subpoena. I mean, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, I always volunteer uh, energy bills as part of. Well, I've had to do this once. Mm-hmm. Uh, as that's a good a, idea. A, you know, like selling hey, point. You, a selling point exactly. Yeah. Like, yeah. look, this is legit. Yeah. These are my propane bills. These electric bills. I'll this is so cheap that. to run. So yeah. maybe that's a hint. Yeah. So like you know, if the seller is not willing to provide that stuff to you. Maybe yeah. that is a red flag. Sure. Yeah. I love the idea of looking for uh, atmospherically vented uh, combustion appliances, either oil or gas, that go into a masonry or s- steel chimney. Uh, that's inevitably going to be a problem if you're going to stay in the house for any period of time. I can guarantee it. Sort of unrelated, but one of the things that you do during that time frame when you know the house is being inspected is to get your air quality and radon testing, water quality testing done is that something that would not allow time for that i was concerned about that i wanted to know usually it does as part of the process after you're already under contract at least that's been my experience before closing that stuff has to be resolved and i know connecticut and vermont both required us to have our water tested uh before uh closing on the real estate deal yeah and um vermont required a rate on test but i don't remember connecticut requiring that yeah, I, we requested one, I know, in New York, and I, it was not part of the inspection process on its own. We had to pay extra for that. So. It was Do you such a whirlwind what? when I did it. I can't remember the order of things. I just remember when my housing inspector was there, I was also doing that. So, I, you know. Yeah. My salt box about real estate transactions are the relationships between home inspectors and agents, mm-hmm. which yes. everyone says it's on the up and up. But I wondered about that, too. I can't imagine it's on the up and up. I mean, they, they both have a, an interest in 
seeing each other get this deal exactly. done. Exactly. Right. Yeah. yeah. You don't want to be the home inspector who kills a deal, and you know it, you you need referrals from real estate agents to stay in business. Like it just seems like a very shady relationship. Mm-hmm. Yep. And they've been a lot of them have been working together for years. I mean, it's like they've got each other's backs, right? They're, yeah, yeah. Like, I think exactly that's the like feeding each other. Like, of course, the agent is going to recommend the person who's not going to be a problem, exactly. right? It's right. Like, yeah. The one who's going to get them their commission. Yeah. The fastest. Mm-hmm. It's just human nature. Uh, that was great. Thanks um, very much for that. What was his name Aaron? Mm-hmm. Thanks, Aaron. Uh, Tony from Upstate New York writes. A good customer of mine is looking for a quote to replace a deck in these photos. Easy, right? Wrong. <laughs> the deck is at ground level. It has PT decking on top of 16-inch uncenter pressure-treated joists. I think the joists are buried in the ground. So if you guys are listening could see this photo, you would see that the deck boards look like they are at the level of the grass, which mm-hmm. means that they are probably two or three inches above the soil. Yeah, with the framing completely underground. underground. Right. Yeah. Um, Super on grade. <laughs> <laughs> he says, surprisingly, it's held up pretty decently after 20 or 30 years. This is a town home, so getting access to the back here for concrete or pavers is out of the budget slash question. We don't have the height to come up at all either because the patio door is so low, right? And the new deck is going to extend out further to the corner of the house. I'm thinking of tearing out the old deck, hand dig- digging down a few inches, landscape fabric, tamped crushed stone, Two by sleepers or joist, uh, space 12 inches on center, and then uh, top those with composite decking. What would you guys do? <laughs> I, I would first ask, what do you mean you can't get pavers That's what I, in I there? That's I was going to say. This is screaming <laughs> like, for a patio. You can, you, well, you can get framing lumber in right. there, but you can't get pavers in there? Yeah. <laughs> what kind of like... Matt's on a tirade I, I don't today. understand. <laughs> like, no, I was just We're going to start recording in the afternoon from now <laughs> well, on. Well, not only that, but the, the cost issue. Like, the pavers would be so much less expensive yeah. than the deck. So I, I just don't but, understand. Like, the whole premise of the question needs to be... I can't help but think that that's the right answer, too. Yeah. yeah. Is, and even though I'm not a fan of patios, Matt and I just yeah. argued over yeah. patios versus decks. There's a nice throwdown story about that. But I think I, his yeah, idea is, is the best scenario f- for doing it the half-baked way, mm-hmm. <laughs> right? I mean, yeah. like, yeah, that's that's the way you have to do it if you want to use wood framing to build this. Yeah. And if the client only has a few hundred dollars or a few a thousand even, like. I don't know what else you're going to do. Mm-hmm. Like, because you're going to have to bring in subgrade materials for a paver patio, right? Yeah. But you can bring in bags of gravel mm-hmm. and bags of sand. You can carry that right through the house if yeah. access is a problem. It's going to be a lot easier to do that than it is going to be to drag 16 foot two by tens or whatever. Well, I don't know that that's true. I mean, because like he's going to have to get rid of native material to make room for this subgrade, right? Like, you know, so that's going to have to go back out of the house. Is he yeah, saying that? But he can only... probably redistribute it back there. We Maybe. don't know that he has to take it out. Yeah. Is the only access point through the house? I didn't I catch no that. Idea, I just thought I... he thought it was, you know, maybe narrow access. Well, or that's something. what I didn't can really get a understand. Truck back there. Yeah. But I mean, a, a plate compactor, the one that I looked up was like 163 pounds. Two you guys can drive can carry that, that right inside. through the living room. <laughs> you can, you, yeah. Well, you can, two people can carry that right through the living room. No problem. <laughs> As easy as they can carry I'm gonna put a that bunch across of the hardwoods. Yeah. <laughs> Wear your booties. Uh, I had a wacky idea. Do it. <laughs> so um, a little tiny connecting deck, say three by four or a couple steps leading from the patio, and then raise the deck. Mm-hmm. It's going to be higher than the bottom of the door, but at least you're getting the framing out of the dirt. Mm-hmm. It might let, look wacky, though, as the, uh, as the risk. He's going to be digging all of those footings down four feet by hand back there. I mean, it would be easier to just dig out by hand if, you, if a shovel is the only option than to, like, just to dig down, you know, six, eight inches for that patio. I've done a lot of piers, and it is it is a lot of work. I don't know if I would say it's more work than, like, moving, you know, cubic yards of topsoil. What about those pin piers? What about those pin piers we were but talking about? But he can't get them back there. Why Probably. not? Those, came, those come apart. They're... Yeah. Well, if you could get the jackhammer and everything that, to the house, that's easy enough. The helical pier rig that I'm familiar with, too, will, like, fit through a 36-inch door. They mm-hmm. just put down plywood on the flooring and drive it right into the building. Yeah. I've actually seen my friend do, like, work in kitchens, right, yeah. to put a pier in for a, a undergirder or whatever. You know what I mean? Does that Do those work well 
in soil that has huge rocks in it? It can be a problem depending on how big. Because, I mean, I live in upstate New York. Yeah, I don't. And I think there's some places it wouldn't work. Yeah, I have very low, very shallow bedrock. And above that, I have boulders and all kinds of gigantic rocks. (laughs) I think you just build on rocks in those cases, right? Yeah. And I have come across that in other projects where we just. You just pinned to we it. hit refusal and, and we just put the footing right on top yeah. of the, yeah. And maybe, we just pinned it. Maybe when this guy starts digging, he'll find some building materials that he can work with. Mm. <laughs> I don't know that composite decking is the right choice. Uh, I mean, I've seen it get really moldy. And if it's gets, mm. if it's as close to the ground, I think that might even be a worse choice than I pressure just, treated. Just lay that Azek right on the dirt. Don't even build the rest of the frame. <laughs> throw some plywood <laughs> down. Just throw some gravel down, run a plate compactor over it, get it nice and flat. <laughs> you are on down. fire today. <laughs> he um, must really, um, he's very dedicated to this client, it yeah. sounds like. He's gonna, yeah, and he's if the client says, I'm out. not going to do a paver patio or a concrete patio, like, w- what What do you do? Do you just say, well, like, I'm not going to work for you, or do you, like, try and accommodate them? I think it's it's a good question. Mm-hmm. I would say you try and accommodate them. Yeah. And you tell them what they're doing is a bad idea, but assuming it's not going to kill them. Yeah, tell them they do the patio, they'll never have to mess with it again. Yeah. Well, that's, well, agreed. They won't. Except you have to weed it, right? <laughs> Maybe. Elastomeric sand, put it in there. Hopefully nothing grows. Throw some Does that work? On it. No. No. See, I told you. I have no idea. <laughs> I've never seen Could stuff growing it. up in there. Maybe then it would work. Yeah, no, then you'd One, uh, really mess it up. An, an uh, additional <laughs> point for this question uh, is our, comes from our friend Mike Curtin, our ed, uh, Fine Home Building editorial advisor. Um, he points out that the original PT lasted so long because it was probably preserved with CCA, mm-hmm. uh, copper chrominate, quaternary maybe arsenate. Yeah, arsenic essentially was probably right. The, it one was of the, the good stuff, yeah. <laughs> as we say in the business. <laughs> um, the newer ground t- contact ACQ doesn't last as long. And yeah, to reinforce this stuff. point, I was watching a carpenter bee like drill holes in my pressure treated uh, bench I built a few years ago, just. Like it was cedar. Mm. It didn't seem to affect this bee at all. And <laughs> <laughs> I, is it, it's, it's not supposed to work that way, right? Huh. Probably not. What do you think? Is it like I, I'm out of my realm? I don't know. We really need a biologist on staff. <laughs> <laughs> is it bug resistant? Is that what, is it supposed to be? Is yeah. that part of pressure treated? Right. Mm. It's like supposed to not be eaten by termites and carpenter ants anyway. I thought at least mold was like the main thing. The I new stuff, I don't know if, like, it does anything. Yeah. I mean, it, it's definitely not as good. It's definitely heavy and... Wet. Inconsistent thickness. <laughs> inconsistently thickness and... <laughs> Width. <laughs> so if you are going to build a deck, what would you use? Probably still PT. Okay. Yeah. It's See, cheap. It's cheap. Yeah. It does it's a cheap. pretty good job. Yeah, it's fine. I just stained my deck, and it's always surprising to me how thirsty it is when I stain it. Just, you know, sucks it right up. So what is your preferred uh, product to put on there? Uh, I don't really have a preferred product. I bought I bought something that was suggested, and that's what I went with, and I'm happy with it. It did, did change the Olympic? tint. Yeah. yeah, but I changed the tint of it. Yeah. So he told you what to get? Yeah, well, remind me what Yeah, that. it was – I had I, – I subscribed to uh, Consumer Reports, and I picked their top pick, and that's what I – recommended it was the olympic i can't remember superior or something like that i can't remember either i can't even remember the name of it. just used it three weeks ago I how they test that stuff i don't know there's but it's a it, it's a whatever it's, an, it's a solid o- stain. it's an oil right. penetrating solid. stain right mm-hmm. solid yeah like you can't see the wood right. through it. i would say like that's the way to go yeah, yeah. latex seems sharp. terrible like on it. decks yeah <clears throat> uh this is John from Dayton, Ohio. My wife and I are considering building a house for ourselves and our two teenage daughters near Dayton. We're curious what is the absolute lowest price per square foot we can expect for a professionally built home. $1,000. <laughs> I don't know. It depends so much on where you're at, right? Like, Depends on where you're at, what you mean by professional. I mean, <laughs> what do you mean the by thing about like a Kia and a Bentley are both made by professionals, but like one is always going to cost less than the other. <laughs> right. A manufactured home is professionally built, but yeah. I mean, the price is I think what he's saying is like uh, that I'm not building myself, right? Okay. That someone, I'm paying someone to do. Yeah. Someone. 
So the absolute Someone. cheapest house that somebody <laughs> who knows something about the codes can build for you? Right. In Dayton. No idea. But I, I did look up their housing prices out there, and they were cheap. remarkably cheap. So what, what did you see? The East Coast. Median was like in the 50s somewhere. What? Get out of for, here. Not for new builds, but just like for uh, for houses sold, I think. In like oh, I'm moving year. to freaking Ohio. I was going to say, I chose the wrong $50,000? Something like that. What do wow. you get for $50,000? <laughs> it depends on where you are. I mean, like if you're in like, even, even if you're in like Syracuse, New York, you could probably get a decent house for Thirty to fifty thousand dollars, maybe. No, wow. I don't believe this. <laughs> so, I rarely disbelieve you. Uh, uh, yeah. <laughs> we got to uh, hear from folks in Ohio and other parts of the Midwest what your houses are selling for. It, yeah. it varies, of course. It's going to be different in Chicago. Well, in the versus median, Dayton. the median and the mean were diff- are different, obviously. Yeah. But and I think like the average selling price was over a hundred thousand dollars. But that is not the same as as the the house priced in the middle. Mm-hmm. What that probably means is that there are a lot of higher end homes. That are, that are sort of like dragging so what that I, price up. I think up. John is asking the yeah. wrong question. I think yeah. he should buy one of these $15,000, $50,000 houses and then have 75000 to remodel it because yeah. you're starting with uh, a sewer and septic infrastructure. You have water connected. You probably have gas or uh, 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 not, but you probably do. <laughs> and you have electricity. These are all things that you don't have to pay mm-hmm. for <laughs> that you do on a new build. Yep. But some um, people want to live in a new home. So recently, it's coincidental, I had a conversation with uh, my friend. That is crazy, Matt. He's showing me a, a, a Zillow graphic. Yeah. I'm anyway, moving to sorry. Dayton. Just keep moving I'm on. moving to Dayton. <laughs> um, so he's, he's building um, a house for a, a family. And uh, it has a block foundation. And, and, the, and the idea was to make this as affordable for them as possible. And... The, the house, keep in mind the house had uh, city services, it has water and sewer, so that immediately lowers the cost, right? Mm-hmm. I mean, you have to pay hookups and you have to run the pipe, but it's way cheaper to do that than to install the whole on-site septic system, which in his area is probably $20,000 because of the clay soils. But anyway, so he's got a block foundation, uh, a f- clear span, eye joist floor system. It's a single story with two by six walls, spaced 24 inches on center. It's got a 412 energy truss roof, um, and it's going to have vinyl siding and laminate flooring, and he's going to build this for 100 bucks a square foot to them. So I, I don't think you could build much cheaper than that. Or, I mean, you wouldn't want to live in something that was cheaper than that. It's yeah. probably going to have vinyl windows. So I think the very minimum, uh, John, to answer your question is uh, 100 bucks a square foot, excluding all the site work and um, the well and a septic system if you need it. I think it's probably better if you live in one of these communities or are close to that you can get a house for fifty thousand dollars. That's the mini- medium. The the let's see what did it say. <laughs> the median listing price right now in Dayton is fifty. No, what was it? Sixty seven thousand dollars median listing price. And there's a bunch of houses here: forty nine thousand nine hundred, fifty thousand, fifty thousand seven hundred. All of which are much larger than my current house and your I current house. I can't get my I can't get my head around <laughs> that. I can't either. I mean, obviously wages are lower uh, in mm-hmm. areas where housing is more affordable, um, but that seems cheap. Yeah, I mean, you could get a two thousand three hundred eleven square foot three bed two bath house for fifty thousand dollars right now. How old is that? I don't know. Yeah, it, what's the housing stock like? How? Yeah, how old? I'm it? guessing it's uh, turn of the century mm-hmm. and newer. That's a nice that, house. Yeah. yeah, looks like a nice house. Oh. We'll throw that up on the webpage. <laughs> 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 Anybody wants to buy? It's, uh, Do we get the split? Otterbein <laughs> Avenue, Dayton, Ohio. Do we get to split the commission with the <laughs> <Yeah>. listing agent? <laughs> yeah, I take five percent. <laughs> Wow, that's that's shocking. You know, for whatever reason, I didn't even think to check what the real estate prices were. I just like figured, well, what the house building prices are. Yeah, I would say dig in your pockets, and whatever you find can probably be a down payment on wow. one of these houses. <laughs> Do you want to talk about that builder that I I just recently yeah, came yeah. across? Yeah, yeah. So you yeah. you you pointed out to us uh, just yesterday, right? That uh, a modest house right. done really well, right? And in fact. It, it was done as a flip. Get out. And oh. earlier we were talking about, or it was made mention of the fact that most flip houses are don't, you know, they're not quality built. 
Um, That's but, not their first motivation, let's right. say. <laughs> but this this is this was. Uh -huh. And there's a lot of custom elements. And uh, I'm going to give a shout out to Art Paychev, I think is how you say his name. And this place is in California? This place is in California in Sacramento. And this guy is 26 years old. This is the first house. The he's, carpenter? He's the carpenter and he's the designer of this place. He's got a good eye. Yes, he does. And uh, he's been working with developers on flip houses since he was 16. That's kind of his main gig right now. Um, and this house was... So he must be self-taught. Yeah. I yeah. mean, yeah, I think he learned on the job. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, and it's got lots of beautiful details, and it, it is solidly built, judging yeah. from some of the things that we learned about it. It's and not it, fancy. It's not fancy. No, and, and I liked... Um, you may remember last week we had got that list from the gentleman who was talking about ways to keep kitchen remodeling affordable. Mm -hmm. And one of his things was to use a conventional range, not a slide in or uh, wall ovens with a cooktop. And that's one of the elements that are in this kitchen. Mm -hmm. I was like, okay, that was clearly done for that reason to save thousands of dollars. Do we have images that I put on there? Yeah. Maybe. Yeah. S yeah. Sweet and simple. Yeah. I like those little awnings on the side too. Yeah, the guy, it, it, he just seems to have a good eye. Yeah, absolutely. And it, it just, I mean, it is like really that's clean really and nice. beautiful. And it was a remodel and the, it was a mess. He had to take out just about, well, he took out three walls and opened it all up like that. It looks like it's only a few hundred square feet, like a lot it's of like 1800, uh, modest. Uh, yeah, 1,800 square feet, I think. It's 1,800? About that, yeah. Oh, wow, it's way bigger than I thought. Oh, really? Yeah. I'm, I wow. think that's what he said. I thought bigger than my house. <laughs> I thought about 800. And I like this story. <laughs> so tell us this story. Yeah. So what we're looking at, for those of you who can't see it, is a, um, a hardwood countertop. Mm -hmm. And it's got this like kind of like lined decorative element on the corner. Right. Um, like diagonal, some of the lines run. Pattern. Yeah, or go diagonal to the corner and then some like project from that. Right. And uh, what's the story behind that? He said it was the end of a long day. He was tired and somehow he thought it would be a good idea to use a circular saw to cut some plywood. On right, top of the on counter. On top of the counter. <laughs> 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 and he made one cut and then he stood back and he thought, well, I might as well make 10 more. <laughs> <laughs> It looks and great. everybody it does, comments on it. It does not yeah. look like a mistake. No, yeah, I, I love that story. I think that, you know, when I was in grade school and, and had an art project, the worst thing the artist, our teacher, could say to me is like, "You could do whatever you want." I'm mm -hmm. like, "I don't want whatever I want. I want some constraints. Yes. I want, I want a problem to solve." And uh, I think some of the best design comes from fixing mistakes. <laughs> Yeah. yeah, it doesn't work as well with laminate countertops, but. <laughs> <laughs> so that was a $90,000 house, and he said that most of that went into the HVAC system. New insulation, new plumbing, new electrical framing. Uh, and he also said that didn't include his wages, work, so that was that wages. was the material cost. Right, right, right. But it's a good-looking little house. But still, it's a nice house. And it, it, yeah. we should point out that the neighborhood that it's in is not Dayton, Ohio. I mean, it's, right. it's a very desirable Yes. You know, it, 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 <laughs> yeah, it, it, oh yeah. yeah, that doesn't mean to say that. It's just, you know, <laughs> I take that You're back. Not wrong. Yeah. yeah. Well. I've never been. To, have I been to Dayton? Once yeah. or twice. My brother lives in Dayton. Yeah. I got the feeling that it's a very walkable community. <laughs> Are you laughing because I've never been to Dayton and my brother yeah, lives there? Yeah, that's what I'm laughing at. <laughs> He's fine. Okay. <laughs> We meet in Pittsburgh usually. Mm. Have you ever driven across the entire state of Ohio? I have. That's why I've not been to Dayton. <laughs> <laughs> I'll say I drive across across the northern part. I guess I've been to, yeah. It's long Cleveland. and flat. Yeah, it's very flat. Southern Ohio is kind of hilly, but um, not the parts I've been in. Cincinnati, been there. That's in a cool city. I like Cleveland too. Uh, we have one more question, right? Hey, guys. Love the podcast. My name is Mike Schaefer. I'm a geometry and construction teacher at Hoffman Estates High School in Hoffman Estates, Illinois. We are a surrounding suburb of Chicago. We currently have two sections of the class running with approximately 50 students. I always read and hear about the huge labor shortage for the trades in Illinois, but many companies and contractors do not know about the good things we're doing at our school to encourage construction. I have two questions. For you, what are the, some of the ways I could reach out to companies or contractors to talk about our program? Also, I'm looking to partner with a company to build an auction off some kind of structure or a tiny home to help build funding and support for our program. Do you know of any companies or contractors that would like to create a partnership with our program? Well, so the first thing I thought, Mike, was if we read this on yeah. the 
podcast mm-hmm. that some social may, media people yeah. might reach out to you. Mm-hmm. Um, short of that, I actually did a story a few years ago uh, about. Um, it's on Cape Cod. It's the Home Builders and Remodelers Association of Cape Cod. And they uh, developed this group called Emerging Leaders in response to the fact that young tradespeople weren't staying on the Cape for work. So Because they can't afford to live there. Yeah. Right. Well, Not everybody can part, dig right. an underground bunker and live right. in that 10 by 10. Yeah. But they we host- should talk yeah. <laughs> what Matt's talking about. What? <laughs> So I showed him a story that my uh, former colleague John Vara wrote for the Journal of Light Construction about uh, a man who was working on Martha's Vineyard Mm -hmm. and who dug a hole in the ground at a Boy Scout camp and (laughs) lived in it. And it wasn't as horrible as you might imagine. It had paneled walls and it actually had light wells and he had a wood stove in there. And um, because of the high cost of housing, like he worked as a carpenter and lived in this bunker Mm -hmm. to make ends meet. Mm -hmm. Right. And he did it for years yeah. until someone stumbled upon his flu pipe <laughs> and they're like, what is this about? And right. he got kicked out. Yep. It's He's probably innovative. still living there somewhere else, <laughs> I'm, is yeah. my guess. But anyway, trade associations. Okay. Yeah. So, well, that's I don't know how that got <laughs> yeah. on. But. Yeah. So they host a residential construction career day that introduces students or young, and young people to professionals in, in the industry. And I was thinking this guy might be able to organize something along those lines on a smaller scale in his region, just using, I mean, he must, be, he must have a network of his own, with lots of professionals to kind of connect young people to, you know, uh, potential employers. You know, and and vice versa, people looking to hire. Yeah, um, I, you know, then that would you know, the, and the, you know, and you have to ask locally. Right? Exactly, that's Having how you start. Having come from the nonprofit world in a previous life, um, the people who are close to your community yeah. are the ones to ask first. Exactly, right? they have a stake in improving the community and seeing that the kids are educated and uh, contributing members of society. That's so right. and I maybe would like go host local. A com- Absolutely, yeah. that's and what also, I think. It's all, yeah, go ahead. Alumni. Yeah, mm-hmm. totally. Like, reach out to the people who have graduated from your program yeah. and are successful. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And ask them if they have any, you know, can come and talk to them or whatever it is or that you're money. trying to get them to do. Yeah, give yeah. money, all kinds of things. And Donate I equipment. I, I mean, like, these guys may have, like, a lull laying around or something like that they can give you. <laughs> I'll be honest. I was surprised at the in-kind donations we would get at the Pittsburgh Habitat for Humanity. Mm-hmm. And uh, oftentimes it only took asking in fact, I called up Lynn Ladder one day and like asked for a bunch of ladders and they're like, okay, mm-hmm. they sent them on their truck. And I mean, it's good for their business to, to, to help, I yeah. believe. Sponsorships. A- and it's also a great tax write off. Yeah, <laughs> mm-hmm. that's true. So, I mean, it's not always altruism, but it is beneficial to all the parties involved. Mm-hmm. Yep. You could also do some community projects with the students or make it part of the curriculum. And get Visibility some is local huge. Press. Yep. Like and you... also just make some videos of the students doing their projects, right? Yeah. And doing their work and get on social media. And... Yeah, as long as it's good. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> what does your school do to help get the word out? All kinds of stuff. I mean, they, they did have or were developing and now have a relationship with the New York State uh, Builders Association. And is that all the kinds of union? Other um, uh, no, it's like just a collection of people who are into building Mm -hmm. who I don't know if they pay dues, but they kind of get together and just talk about building. And I think there's some sort of like a code component, you know, like they're interested in either having things in the code or not in the code. And so they're, you know, probably lobbying, yeah, yeah, lobbying the legislature to make sure that, you know, sprinklers sprinklers are not required in, you know, like every single home when you are on a well and there's absolutely no way it can keep up with it. But, you know, that's something that keeps coming up. I wonder if that'll ever get put into the code. I think in some places it is, but a lot of states have removed those provisions. It makes sense if you're on municipal water, but I mean, my pump would never be able to keep up. Mine either. Yeah. But you hope that it puts the fire out quickly. Yeah. In which case running out of well water would be a good thing because then it wouldn't keep flooding your house. (laughs) (laughs) Um, Do you think this, this school must have a board, right? How active are they in getting the word out? I would, I would yeah, go to them. that too. But actually, I mean, also, I said alumni because the school also did have like an alumni. Uh, I don't know if it's an association or what, but they were they are there is a board mm-hmm. that there are a bunch of alumni members on, and I mean they to some extent I think steer the direction exactly. that the curriculum is going, and you need to help them and steer in the right yeah, direction. Yeah, and so I mean the school is engaged with those people who are like actually out there, and mm-hmm. you know, so exactly. they can teach the things that these people need. That's right. The um, edu- the 
Carpentry Education program in, in my high school built a uh, modular home every year. It was usually like a, a double wide, you know, two modules, and they mm -hmm. would just auction that off mm -hmm. to the general public. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, I mean, that's another option is just like if you can get the stuff, just build it and then. Yeah. And it doesn't need to be that big. I mean, it could be garden sheds or right. something. Yeah. Yeah. Well, or yeah. fancy dog houses I've seen uh, yeah. vocational pro programs do. Yeah. Or playhouses. Because mm -hmm. you like have to do all the same things in a playhouse that you do in a normal house, just smaller, which seems like a great way to teach people carpentry skills without using all the resources to build a full-size house. Yeah. Which is probably why he wants to build this tiny house. Yeah, I suspect. Um, I just got a couple things that uh, someone sent to me. Oh, this was actually got on the uh, Building Knowledge Facebook uh, page that I follow and I'm friends with a bunch of the people on there. But uh, this came from uh, MSNBC, or excuse me, MSN.com. Aspiring professional plumbers in Texas may soon no longer need to pass exams <laughs> before entering the trade or adhere to regulations after lawmakers fail to extend the life of the state agency that oversees plumbers and the state plumbing code. That's, this agency is set to uh, sunset on September 1st. That's great. <laughs> <laughs> so... Apparently, there's a huge uh, shortage of plumbers in the state of Texas owing to the flooding and uh, severe storms and the incredible uh, amount of residential construction that is in Texas. And yeah. I've seen firsthand. Me it's too. like insane. It's insane. Um, so in order to solve this problem, they're going to stop licensing plumbers. <laughs> <laughs> That seems like an excellent idea. Is that idea. really what's going on, or are they yeah. just like having a hard time trying to get the legislation through? Well, so they, they want to transfer the um, regulating of the plumbing trade to another state agency. Mm -hmm. And um, I want to read what one of the lawmakers said. Um, I'll first read what exactly happened. Uh, the Texas State Board of Plumbing Examiners, the agency that regulates and licenses plumbers, was due for a so-called sunset process, a legislative review in which lawmakers decide on whether to continue running such state entities. During the review, lawmakers failed twice to agree on a bill which would have allowed the agency to continue running, as reported by the Texas Tribune. Um, the Senate Bill 621, 621 sought to reassign the roles and responsibilities of the agency to the Texas Department of Licensing and Regulation, a larger agency that also oversees dozens of professions. <clears throat> Roger Wakefield, master plumber and owner of Texas Green Plumbing in Richardson, said the industry is now essentially completely unregulated and could result in a surge of unqualified workers. That's scary. <laughs> this is what one... Um, well, this is what he said. Uh, we're going to put the safety of our homeowners and the public of Texas in jeopardy, Wakefield told the Tribune. Plumbers install medical gas. They install the potable drinking water that we have every day. If they're not doing it right, people's safety is at risk. One of the legislators who was... <laughs> in, you think it's so funny? <laughs> it's not funny. It's terrible, right? It's terrible. <laughs> One of the legislators who was questioning the, the sanity of uh, doing this mm -hmm. was like, Oh, that's great. We've just solved the plumbing problem by making everyone in the state of Texas plumbers. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, essentially. You only need to know three things, right? <laughs> Who goes downhill? Payday is Friday. Don't chew your fingernails. <laughs> <laughs> so like of all the trades to decide not to regulate, this one is really baffling to me. Yeah. I mean... I bet there's a bunch of municipalities out there, though, that don't have any kind of plumbing inspections already. I'm sure that's true. But, I mean, if the state of Texas is at least requiring you to be licensed, you would assume that there is a certain amount of knowledge that, they, mm. that you know, a certain amount, degree of – you don't agree. I, I don't know. Just because in a lot of states all you have to do is pay for the license. You don't have to pr prove Take any kind of competency. Yeah. Really? Yeah. I would not have thought that. Yeah. Uh, where I was building in Pittsburgh in Allegheny County had some of the most strict uh, plumbing regulations uh, mm -hmm. in the country. Uh, it was not easy to be a plumber there. I mean, yeah. it was, and then I think that's good. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Right. I, like yeah. you have to know what you're doing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but I don't think that's, it's not universal. Fortunately, you don't have to be licensed to be a magazine editor. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> None of us would be here. <laughs> uh, Somebody else uh, sent me this, and we'll put it up on the podcast page, but it was um, – you guys probably haven't seen this, but chch.com, which I think is a Canadian television station, had some footage of 
uh, a person, I'm going to assume it was a guy, um, <laughs> driving down. I was it stupid? That. <laughs> <laughs> a provincial highway, uh -huh. like this six lane highway with oh, two by fours. <laughs> <laughs> sticking out his back doors like he laid yeah. them across the back seat and had the doors open and he's driving down the street like this and unbelievable it's hilarious so That's if you want to laugh check that out on our podcast page do you guys have anything no i think i said my piece i'm gonna throw my pencil just like dave letterman call this thing <laughs> oh my eye <laughs> wonder if he still does that at his house <laughs> yeah no he's got a no he's got a show, show. Oh. or is it a podcast I don't know. I think it's it's like what is it HBO? I don't know. Netflix? I don't think Something. anyone watches it. Prime? Is it stand up? I it. No, it's a No, it's like interviews it's with like oh, his, okay. his old people. show. Yeah. Did he ever do stand up? Well, he did the monologue at the beginning. Okay. You mean like as a before like, that? Yeah. Comedian? I don't right, know. Right, right. For some Way reason before I always, my time. Yeah, me too. I never really You're lying. <laughs> <laughs> no, Dave and I, I remember when he was on at 11 in the morning. How old really? So he had a daytime show on the network TV? Yep. For who? Was it NBC? That I don't remember. Didn't Jim Gaffigan have a show that was kind of like based on Letterman's life or something like that? I'm He's totally the base, uh, I'm sure. heavy set comic? Yeah, yeah, a little bit. Pale guy, pale dad. Does he do, <laughs> right, the dad guy? Yeah. 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 Who lives with his family in like a Manhattan apartment something and like his that, five yeah. kids or something. Yeah. Yeah, he's hilarious. What does that have to do with this? Just that he and I th he had a show that I think was loosely based on Letterman's life at some point. Really? I think so. I think they're both Indiana boys. We'll have to look into that. Yeah. Well, unfortunately, that is... <laughs> I'm just going to get away. <laughs> well, unfortunately, that is all the time we have for today. Thanks to Matt, Kylie, and Jeff for joining me. And thanks to all of you for listening. Remember to send us your questions to fhbpodcast at taunton.com. And please send us some questions. We were kind of thin um, this time. But they were good. But we didn't have a lot to choose from. Fortunately, they were good. I particularly like the questions where we get a story out of it. We've had two now but since I've been on. So what was the, your favorite here? The, all of the tips for what to look for when you buy a house. Buy a house. So you, you think our their comment content is better than ours for sure. I think we, I, I think that, we can absolutely work with this guy. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and please comment uh, or like us however you're listening, even dislike us, whatever. It helps other folks find our podcast. Thank you all for listening. Keep craft alive and happy building.